Um, so uh, I'm going to speak about uh, DSLs, uh, OCaml and Catala. So this is joint work with uh, Denis Merigo, uh, Donat in Ria Paris. I should also thank OCaml Pro, who was kind enough to sponsor me starting working on this before I started uh, officially at Ria. Um, expect this to be an experience report and um, some tricks we we learned uh, while while writing this DSL, uh, which I think could deserve to be more publicized. I'll first uh, give a few words about what Catala is, then about uh, DSL and compiler architecture uh, in a very broad sense, and then uh, some of the the things we did uh, for Catala. Uh, so Catala is a DSL for the low uh, that's tailored for faithful computations as described by law. The important word is computations described by law, not any law, but like tax laws or social benefits, stuff like that. Um, we have two main goals for these, to be readable by lawyers um, and to follow the structure of, logic, of the law uh, by using a specific default logic, which was um, an ID coming from Sarawski uh, uh, quite recently. So the DSL being readable by lawyers enables us to do pair programming. And since we want to do faithful computations, it's very important that the lawyer can understand the code and the programmer can understand the law through the lawyer's explanation. Also, uh, the following the structure of the law enables us to do uh, literate programming uh, so that the program follows the structure and uh, it's very precious for updates and many other things. So that's why we have a LaTeX type. Eva, I invite you to, to see the website for The generally um, accepted way to, to design compilers and and DSLs uh, is to use uh, many passes uh, with each pass transforming from an, one IST to the other. Uh, the point being uh, that you can reflect the construction of your compiler and the transformations at the type level. Uh, so typically, you will have uh, ASTs that will be pretty similar to their neighbors and a targeted pass that we just translate a few nodes from one to the other. So the direct approach for this, which uh, is okay for, for big projects, I guess, uh, is to define uh, one module with one separate variant type for each AST. The problem with this is that you end up with lots of boilerplates because between your different uh, type definitions, that there will be a lot of overlap. Uh, and then if you want printers for your intermediate ASTs, if you want uh, traversal functions, any tooling function, and even when you translate from one AST to the next, uh, you will have to repeat all the case of your AST because everything is translated as, at each step. Uh, this also reduces the opportunity for tooling across passes, and makes the specific work uh, being done by your pass less obvious. So one answer to these, uh, which have been coined a la carte by Espresso, uh, is to add some hierarchy to the terms um, by defining uh, your uh, main AST as uh, constructors that gather a few terms, uh, and here, using open recursion on X, you have the lambda terms grouped together, which recurs in your main AST term, and so on for different uh, sub cases of the AST. So this this works and allows you to write functions just once for each family, functions like printers and so on. Uh, so it reduces the boilerplate you need to have to just the combinations of this. So for each of your AST, you will write different combination, and you will have to, to combine the, the, the printers, for example, for the different ones, but it will, it will be much lighter. 
uh, it still adds some weight. And for example, when you pattern match, everything is one a step deeper. So it's not perfect uh, and still has some boilerplate left. So we, we wanted to something uh, more lightweight than this. So one idea to the, the simplest possible would be to group all the terms in a unique flat stack. So in this way, it's very easy to write um, a printer that will work on all your ACs because you just have one. Uh, of course, uh, we don't want to give up on typing the different classes. Uh, so we need some uh, more tooling uh, to do that. So we need basically subtyping to select some uh, uh, so some terms of uh, UAST uh, for each ASTI. So there's an obvious way to do this actually. Uh, OCaml uh, provides polymorphic variants, which just allows to do that. So you could uh, group uh, your terms in families uh, like we did before, but instead of nesting them one step further, you can just use type union and have all your um, all your terms together. So the, this is works. Um, uh, I I don't know, but I would be interested if it's used uh, in uh, in big systems. Um, but there is a big drawback, uh, in my opinion, that you are basically switching uh, totally to structural typing, uh, and unless you add Type annotations everywhere, which is not something we like to do. Uh, for example, a pattern match will always type, type correctly, and instead of saying you are missing a case or you made a typo on this case, it will type, and then you will have a type error much later on, and the type error will be very verbose, and that's not pleasant at all. So the solution, as always, is to use a GEDT. Uh, so GEDTs are very fun. Um, uh, I don't think I will have to convince most of the audience here. But they have a huge drawback is that they're frightening to lots of people. And uh, sometimes you don't want the code for your DSL to be only maintainable and understandable by your camel gurus. So here we'll use a very simple GDT that is only used to select a subset of terms for some parameter. So let's get started. Um, so this is my uh, starting AST, uh, supposing a, a variance type where I gathered all my cases. So I have lambda terms and exception terms. Um, then I translate that to GEDT. So I just add one type parameter. Uh, here the syntax changes a bit, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the return type is kx, so that's just uh, always loud. But for the raise and catch, I just add a constraint on my k parameter. So how do I use that then? Uh, I define phantom type. They can be anything, but they need to be disjoint. And then if I use astxcx uh, for one ast definition, uh, going back, here, this constraint is um, is verified, so I can use all the nodes here. Uh, oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I think, yeah. um, and then, uh, if I use anything else that is disjoint with this type, then the the uh, these cases will be refuted, and I will basically have a variance type with only these three cases. So this is what we wanted. We have two separate types, but that have a super type on which I can write generic functions. Of course, here I just used one Boolean parameter with one uh, type variable. Uh, I need many more, and I don't want many more type variables. So I will need basically row type variables. Uh, for which there are two providers uh, in OCaml, polymorphic variants and object types. So we've played with both. Uh, they both work, 
but object types ended up being much uh, more convenient to use, slightly more verbose, but much clearer and much clearer errors. So how does that go? Here are my two ASTs. So this is the object type uh, where I can define flags. Well, technically these are method types, but I don't care. Uh, with the phantom types, uh, yes and no. And I can just define flags for my different AST. And when I define the main type, I can say that uh, the app node uh, actually forces the constraint that the lambda flag is set to yes. And this is my raw variable I will offer, uh, anything else. So if I write a literate term containing just app, app terms, uh, it will just have the constraint that lambda is yes. If there's both, Lambda and exceptions will need to be yes, and then unification works uh, pretty well. Um, so how do I use that? Uh, if I want to write a generic printer, the only addition needed is to add the polymorphic type annotation to a universal quantify k when we recurse. And then I write all the cases for my generic AST, and I have a printer that I can use on all my passes. Uh, for traversal now, something a little more complex. Uh, my favorite way of doing this is um, open recursion. So I write a non-recursive function that takes, so it's polymorphic as before, uh, it takes uh, a mapper for uh, an expression, and then it will just deconstruct and reconstruct after calling f on each subterm, uh, my AC. So when I want to use that, I write uh, this time a recursive function. So for the case I want to transform, uh, here suppose we have latins and we want to translate that to lambda calculus, we, we can do the rewrite and call the function recursively normally. But for cases where I don't want to do transformation, uh, I just have to call shallow map uh, with my function here and here, and it will destruct them, uh, recurse with latent to apply, and then rebuild the same thing. So that, that works well. There's a big limitation though, because here it just only translates from one k to the next. Uh, the interesting functions I'll have to deal with uh, will actually uh, be the ones that translate to one, from one AST to the next. So, um, so I wouldn't be able to use that. Uh, there is a trick uh, which slightly complexifies the type. So what uh, what we need here, so the function f is the one that will be uh, called in the end, so it needs to be from k1 to k2. Here I universally, universally quantify both these variables. And the trick is that uh, the expression that will be fed into shallow map needs a uh, more explicit type, uh, which will actually be defined with a surface uh, type parameter and a deeper type parameter. And when I say that I am in the app uh, node case, this constrains the surface uh, parameter, but not what's deeper in them. So what that means is that uh, um, here, uh, when I match this node, uh, actually the translation is only using latin to apply, it, so there's no trouble. But here, these I already know that latin has been excluded from that match case. So when I call shallow map here, I know that the surface term can't be a latin, so the written term can't be a latin either, and I can return this. Uh, what's uh, interesting? is that uh, here to this, this is a bit verbose, but I can define my uh, exp type as before by just putting uh, an equality constraint between the two cases. And this complexity uh, only appears when I actually make use of that function and uh, not everywhere in, uh, in the code. So it's, it's localized complexity. Um, and it allows to write uh, past translations that are very, very um, concise. Because basically, uh, for, for, for this way to review or pass, uh, I, can, I can just write this case I want to transform and the rest are, are, are left as is. 
So I, I give the example here of, uh, of Mac, but this scales to, to different uh, travels. Uh, I have a few seconds to start. So this is a different, uh, very, very simple technique, but I think it's, uh, it's quite nice, uh, a very simple trick that's uh, independent. So it's how you we put annotations on every node in our AST. Uh, so it's useful to have polymorphic annotations, and we use them for code positions, which are uh, required for error messages, but also for types and for past specific information. Uh, for example, union finds types during the typing and stuff like that. Uh, and basically, we just have mutual recursivity between the the base node type, which recurs in the X type, which is just a pair with the annotations. It's very simple, but it's pretty convenient. Uh, so to conclude, um, this still has a couple limitations. Uh, so some error messages get a little bit more verbose, but as I said, this is pretty contained, and I, I was pretty happy with it compared to other approaches. Uh, basically, you you get a little more verbosity when you do normal stuff, and uh, a little bit more when you want to do polymorphic traversals and, and stuff like that, where the complexity resides. Uh, small annoyance is that there's no covariance on the GADT, um, on the K parameter, which basically means it's a little difficult to write a function that would work on a subset of your different classes, but not all of them. Uh, but it's not so bad. Uh, so when you have very different ASTs, of course, maybe you don't want to merge them all, so we still have a different surface AST, for example, in, uh, in Catala. Uh, this works when you have small classes. Um, and of course, this forces you to centralize all the definitions for your ASTs, which might not be a bad thing, but we don't have a choice anymore. The biggest uh, strength, uh, in my opinion, of this is that the code for a single pass will actually be written in the exact same way it would have been written if we had defined a specific variant just for this pass. And actually, we translated from uh, a compiler, re a first prototype we written with this uh, approach, and it was very straightforward, and we didn't have to change the, most of the code for the passes. So really, this is where this shines. Uh, so as I said, the complexity is limited to generic function. And I couldn't detail everything, of course, here. But this scales pretty well to mutually dependent types, uh, lots of passes. We use bindly, but that works well too. So if you want to see concrete examples, you can check the code on GitHub and feel free to ask questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louis. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Do we have? Yes, we have questions in the audience. Uh, hi. Uh, that's very nice work. Uh, have you thought about putting it out as a framework outside of the project so other can reuse it? Uh, well, that's yeah. Uh, that's a good idea. Um, the thing is that the. Um, the, the, the interesting part is on the definition of the, of the AST itself. So really, it's a recipe. Uh, tricks like using object types for parameters uh, are known uh, among gurus, but I think they should be better known. But I don't see exactly how a library would help with this approach, because it's really uh, specific to the types you will actually want to use in your ASTs. We have time for one more question. If there's none, we can try to be back on schedule. And so let's thank Louis again for his talk. Thank you.